First of all, welcome to our session, second session of the afternoon, Advice to the Secretary of State. My name is Stanley Wolf, and I'll be your chair today. I'm a member of the J Street uh, National Advisory Circle, and I welcome you all here today. Um, a couple of things that I think you've heard before. Please, uh, once again, check your devices and make sure that we don't get disturbed in the middle of uh, our discussion. Um, towards the end of our time together, we're going to have an opportunity to, to have you line up at the microphone over here in the middle and ask questions. Uh, and I emphasize questions and uh, not statements. So uh, one or two lines that constitutes a question uh, and then we'll have the people who uh, we are privileged to have with us today uh, provide, provide their insights. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, you know, considering that we know that between 60 and 70 percent of Israelis are supportive of a two-state solution and the same, about the same percentage, 60 to 70 percent of Palestinians are supportive, and also from Oslo to Omet, we have an idea and we've exchanged what the parameters of that, settle, uh, that, that agreement would be. So uh, it, it, it should be easy. We should be able to do it tomorrow. But what is this that uh, the history of failed negotiations in the past, however, have placed this pessimism <laughs> surrounding the Carrier Initiative? And uh, uh, just to illustrate that, when, when the talks were first announced, J Street had a mission to Israel and the Palestinian territories at that time. And we happened to meet then with Salam Fayyad the, the next day. The, uh, he, it was just a few days before he left his position as uh, the Palestinian uh, Prime Minister. And we thought that we would get from him a certain excitement about the possibility of these uh, talks uh, re reigniting, restarting. But he was in somewhat a, a somber mood. Uh, and he expressed that his hope and his primary concern was that, um, that Kerry was well prepared to know what to do when the parties walked away from the table. And that certainly gave us food for thought. And he then said that um, he, he, he was concerned that the United States would lose patience given the amount of time that this is going to need in order to come to a, a resolution. So I think uh, we are certainly privileged today to have a distinguished pa panel that will address this issue and uh, discuss with us some of the dynamics and in their experience bring some lessons from past negotiations. So with that, I'd like to hand over the microphone to our moderator for the session, uh, Janine Zakaria here to my right. Ms. Zakaria was the Jerusalem Bureau Chief and Middle East Correspondent for the Washington Post from 2009 to 2011, and has written for Reuters, Bloomberg News, and The New Republic. She's currently a visiting lecturer at Stanford University. And uh, Ms. Zakaria, welcome. Thank you, Stanley. Thank you to J Street for inviting me and for putting together such a fabulous panel. How's everybody doing? All right. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly so we can get right into the heart of the matter. Hussam has to leave 10 minutes early because of a back-to-back -back scheduling conflict. Um, today's panel is advice to the Secretary of State. Anybody who knows John Kerry knows that he does not believe he really needs advice, especially on this issue which he's been dealing with for a long time. Nevertheless, we're going to endeavor to come up with some advice to him. I don't know how we're actually going to get it to him, but we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a way. Now, there's a lot going on on Iran and Syria and lots of other issues. Um, but we've been asked to really focus on advice to the Secretary of State on an is Israeli-Palestinian conflict and how to solve it. So we'll try to keep to that. After all, we are on this month celebrating 20 years of the Oslo uh, peace negotiations. So it's, it's a good time to take account and see if we really can drive it home in the last nine months. Now, I echo some of the skepticism that Stanley mentioned is pervading a lot of the people watching this. Um, and thinking on my, personally, the first time I was in Israel as a young student was in 94, January 94, three months after the signing of the Accords. I've spent a lot of my, you know, almost two decades reporting on Israel, and I think one of the things we have to acknowledge and to frame the, the discussion about is that Israel of 1994 is not the same Israel as today. And just looking at the most recent election in Israel, 
where the price of cottage cheese got more attention than the Palestinian issue um, creates a certain problem on the Israeli side for really focusing attention on this matter and I think actually achieving some results. So with that, I'm going to introduce the people who are going to help us unpack all this, see what the prospects are for actually achieving a deal within the next nine months. Um, immediately to my right is Gadi Baltiansky. He's the Israeli Director General of the Geneva Initiative, a group that has drafted already a model peace agreement um, and is, is helping to really try and reverse some of the things I just mentioned and create an environment for peace. He's been an official member of, the, of many Israeli negotiating teams and from 1999 to 2001 served as press secretary to Prime Minister Ehud Barak. Actually, to the far right over there is Daniel Levy. He um, got a shout out from Tzachi Negbi a little earlier. I don't know if anybody heard the Levy mentioned. That's him. Um, he's the director of the Middle East and North Africa program at the European Council on Foreign Relations and a senior research fellow at the New America Foundation. He's also been an official member of Israeli negotiating teams and served as senior policy advisor to former Israeli Justice Minister Yossi Balin. We then have Hussam Zamlat, the executive deputy commissioner of the Fatah Commission for International Affairs, and he's currently serving as a visiting fellow at Harvard's Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Mr. Zomlat served as the PLO representative to the UK from 2003 to 2008. So the way this is going to work is each of the panelists, um, I think we're going to go actually just in this order, straight down, is going to offer about five minutes of reflections, their main advice to the secretary on the issue. I'll ask a few questions to get us started, and then you'll be able to line up and ask questions. And I ask you when you ask your questions, and I teach journalism at Stanford now, so I teach question asking. Please ask a question, first of all. And uh, if you want to make comments later, that's fine. And please try and keep it tight and succinct. So think about your question during the remarks. Don't, don't prepare it when you get up there. All right, with that, we'll get started. Gadi, you're up. Shalom. Uh, thank you, Stan Lee. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Jay Street. Um, so, my first message to the Secretary of State, not surprisingly, I would say, yes, you can. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is so sad that it's funny, you know, because it should be obvious. I know it's very popular to say, no, you cannot, it's so hard. Uh, you won't make it, and then you go to plan B, C, Z, whatever. Uh, and then you fell into this trap of the self-fulfilling prophecy. Because if you can't make it, don't bother. If you don't, and then if you don't bother, obviously you will not make it. I'm not saying that the opposite is, is, is a self-fulfilling prophecy as well, but I, I think he can do it. And if, if we're speaking among ourselves, nobody's listening. <laughs> when you think about what do we have in this town, President Obama, uh, the Speaker of the J Street Conference, Vice President Biden, Secretary Kerry, Secretary Hagel. I mean, I, I know for some in the Middle East, maybe it's a nightmare. For us, it's a dream team. It's really a dream, the dream team. So yes, I think they can do it. I, now, what would be my, my only advice to Secretary Kerry? I know he doesn't, he's not, he doesn't fall in love in getting advice, so I'll give only one. I think he should think about the day when it, when, it's, when it will be over, when his term will be over, when the, the current round of negotiations will be over. There will be one moment when he will look at the mirror and he will ask himself, did I do everything I could to reach an agreement? And my advice for him would be, do everything to reach that moment and to answer to yourself with a positive answer. That yes, you did everything you could. Now what is this everything? Since it's only the opening remarks, five minutes, I will mention only three points. <laughs> we spoke about past negotiations, past process. So first of all, the first thing, get rid of, of this past, of, of the of the old habits, old language, you know, the language of the U.S. cannot want peace more than the parties themselves, the, the process, and eventually it's their process and so on. Yeah, right. 
We saw it when we resumed negotiations. Yeah, we saw it over the last few years when uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, President Abbas, run to each other to fall into the arms of the, of the other. Yeah, let's resume negotiations. Let's talk. Uh, don't bother us. We will do it by our own. Was this the case? Or was it Secretary Kerry who came with endless number of shuttle diplomacy trips and convinced with this determination both parties to enter the room? You mentioned the, I think Stanley mentioned the, the Kerry initiative. It's, a, it's the Kerry initiative. It's your process. You should own it. The U.S. should own the process. I remember this uh, research that I once read. People who rent cars wash them much less than people that own cars. <laughs> if you have a car that is rented, you don't wash it so much. But it's, if it's yours, yes, wash it. I, I'm not speaking about brainwashing, but wash it at least. <laughs> Clean it, maintain it, and drive it. It's your, it's your, it's your process. N number two. Um, what do you think of, of doing tomorrow? Do it today. Actually, I, we know that eventually there will be an American paper on the table. American parameters, American plan, American initiative, call it whatever you want. Not only that, we know even what will be written in this paper. So I ask myself if, if it will resemble the Geneva Initiative model in 98% or 94%. But between us, it's not so important. We all know what are the parameters of the American paper and what are the parameters of, of a future deal. The question is not the substance of the paper, but the timing. Now, it cannot be too soon. Let me tell you that. We are already beyond the point that <laughs> it was possible to present it too soon. It can be only too late. Now, since we know the Middle East, some of us live there, we know that there are developments on the ground, uh, political circumstances, uh, all the unexpected developments that are really so expected. So don't wait for the unexpected. It will come. Just do it as, as soon as possible. Because only by doing that, you will not impose the nature of a decision on the leaders, but you will impose on them the need to have a decision, to make a decision. You will impose on them the moment that they are trying to avoid, and this is the moment of truth. And the natural, human, and for sure political tendency is to postpone the moment of truth after the holidays, after the winter, after the elections, after something, because it has to do with national risks, political risks, even personal risks. So bring the parties to the crossroads where they have to make the decision. And number three, and, and my, my last point. Present not only the solution, but present also the alternatives. What will happen if we don't reach the solution? And here, since I was asked to speak mainly about Israel, I will in one minute focus only on the Israeli angle. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, I'm sure, wants the best for his country and for his people. But in his own thinking, he doesn't want only the best, he wants the less worst for his people. Because for him, all options are bad. And he has to choose. What can he do? He's the prime minister. He, he has to choose. It's like when he resumed negotiations. He had to choose between uh, recognizing the 67 line as a basis for negotiation, freezing settlements, or releasing prisoners. In my eyes, he chose the, the wrong choice, the worst choice among the three, since anyway an agreement will be based on 67, what are the settlement blocks? Beyond which line exactly? The, the, I don't know, the goal line, the, 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 the end zone line, what, which line ex exactly exists but the 67 line? And since we don't want a binational state for sure, we don't want to have more settlements. But he decided to release prisoners. Fine, why? Because the alternative in his eyes were worse. And in this context of the alternative, I want to just mention his book. Some people say if you want to know a person, read his book. You don't have to read Netanyahu's book, don't worry. <laughs> but, but I recommend to take a look at the cover of the book. Just the cover, the title. The title of his book is Place Among the Nations. This is his book. For him, this is maybe the most important thing 
that Israel will have a deserved place among the nations, talking about alternatives for, for, not, uh, for not reaching an, an agreement. Now, I wish we had very courageous leaders um, <coughs> back, back there in the Middle East. I'm not sure this is the case. But maybe the opposite can also work. And maybe people who are afraid of the alternatives can also, by default even, reach to the right point. So I know that, uh, that the, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But I'm not sure President Roosevelt knew Benjamin Netanyahu. <laughs> and I think maybe his fears should be part of our hopes. Thank you very much. We're going to hear from, we're going to hear from Daniel next. Thank you very much, Janine and Stanley, and it's great to be on a panel with Gadi and Hussam, and it's great to be at a J Street conference that's the largest ever, and what's even greater is every conference we have, we can use that sentence. <laughs> I, I want to start by saying this. I think it is a positive thing that you have the Secretary of State engaged personally in the way in which he is. In the first six months of his term, he visited the region. Israel-Palestine to address this issue as many times as Secretary Clinton visited in her entire four years in office as Secretary of State. The fact that the President, in his UN address last week, said that he has two priorities, the Iran nuclear file and an Arab-Israeli peace, is not something we should take for granted or take lightly. And to be honest, given where the Israeli side is today, and given what I humbly would suggest is something of a lack of strategy on the Palestinian side, we do need that external actor. I'm not necessarily thrilled by the early signals of how this has been gone about. I fear that we may repeat some of the old mistakes, the emphasis on bilateral negotiations, the absence <coughs> of a terms of reference, and my friends and colleagues at the Molad think tank in Israel did, a, I think, a very intelligent response to Ian Lustig's piece in the New York Times uh, on Open Zion where they, they talked about how you move beyond the fetishization of the process and think of a different way of getting there. But that's not where I want to focus today. Gadi had three points. I want to make four points. Hussam, the pressure's on you now to make five points, apparently. <laughs> and my four points are as follows. Number one, get that breakthrough with Iran. That's where I want to begin. Don't let this get derailed, including by your visitors tomorrow at the White House. It's, it is significant in itself. It is significant for the region. It is significant for world security. It is historic. It is the best solution to have a diplomatic solution. But also it's significant to the issue that we're discussing on Israel-Palestine. Sure, President Obama will be get all, called all kinds of names by the Israeli right. But if we can get that breakthrough, then I would argue it does something really important to one aspect of this, which is shifting the Israeli mindset away from the constant sense of fear, survivalism, and the ease with which irresponsible politicians can use scaremongery every single day with their publics, and it is so effective. Hope, hope is a security currency as well, and nothing breeds success like success. And of course, the Iran issue is a fabulous distraction for a government like this from dealing with Palestine and Israel. I also don't think the Secretary of State is going to focus on this nine-month negotiating period unless and until we find out where Iran is going. <clears throat> i say one more thing on this, which may be a stretch, but I'm, I'm trying to think it through in my own head, which is I wonder how much the entire Netanyahu project unravels if the great Iranian threat is taken off the table. And, and I, I just think it's worth, it's worth trying to develop that, which I won't do here, because I'm going to try and be as quick and as telegraphic as possible so that Janine doesn't start kicking me. Um, second point, then. Try and advance the right kind of conversation inside Israel, in Israel's domestic politics, with the Israeli public. 
try and have that impact. I don't delude myself that political realities here allow America to use the leverage that it does have with Israel. I just acknowledge that's not going to happen. But America can help shape and sharpen and focus the debate in Israel and the choices that Israelis have to confront. What does that mean? The first thing I'd say is if we're going to have this conversation about two states, focus on territory. I think that's where the right, and, 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 and Gadi talked about this earlier, I think that's where the right is on the weakest ground. For me, territory, of course, includes Jerusalem. Don't shy away from saying 67 with equal swaps. I'm not sure we're ready to deal with the 48 issues. We can scream and shout about the need to recognize a Jewish state. But if we do nothing to recognize Palestinian history and the Nakba, then we can't explain, expect this to be a one-way street. And part of that, part of that is for the Americans to engage more actively with, with American politics and with America, with America, with Israeli politics and with Israeli coalitions. You heard earlier in that plenary, we had, I think, representatives, I think we have representatives of six parties here. We had four or five on that panel. There is an alternative coalition in the making. I think the Haredim are our potential allies in peacemaking. And if we have to make a hard choice over what comes first, with all due respect to certain issues of church and state and praying at a wall, and I know this is difficult for people to hear in this audience, but I put peace and ending the occupation first if I need the Haredim as my allies. <laughs> and you have three years in which to do this. Don't just look at this as nine months and don't just look at this as something you only have to do with Netanyahu. You may have an opportunity to do this with a different Israeli leadership and with a different Israeli coalition. Third point. I guess there's as many do's as don'ts in this. Don't make the asymmetry worse. I think we have to look back on Oslo and at least acknowledge things like mutual recognition in the first Oslo agreement where they recognized Israel and we recognized the PLO actually didn't help. And if we, if we further embed asymmetry into this process, we're not going to get where we need to go because a deal has to be sustainable. That applies to security. If you over tip the apple cart on security, if you reduce the real sovereignty from this Palestinian state, we actually don't help ourselves. I would apply that to an interim deal. There is such a thing as, as, a, as a bad deal. I know Bibi talks about that in the Iran context. I'm going to talk about it in this context. And if you take as your starting point, well, this is the most that the Israeli traffic can bear, the Israeli political traffic can bear, I would say look for a different road to travel on when it comes to approaching the Israeli traffic. And it goes back to what I said before, that three years is a long time, and don't assume that this government is there forever. A Palestinian state on a limited amount of territory, without sovereignty, without Jerusalem, which is, I imagine, what might possibly be on offer is the formalization of a Bantustan status, and it is not a step on the road to a dignified, sustainable two-state solution. And and allow others who are willing to use a bit of leverage to use it. This is the other thing I'd say in this context on asymmetry. If you have a Europe that is ready to say, we are not going to treat Israel proper, which we recognize, and the occupation and the settlements, which we don't recognize the same way, and if you understand something which by now you should really understand, which is impunity does not help Israelis make hard decisions, having no costs and consequences for the occupation, does Israelis no favors whatsoever, then you should not be leaning heavily on other third parties to make that distinction between Israel proper and the settlements. Let me draw that point to a close and make my final point. And my final point is perhaps the hardest one, which is that Israel needs to undergo a more fundamental change. That has to be driven back in Israel. There was a fantastic panel uh, this morning with um, 
Hagai Elad and Merav Michaeli and Noam Shizaf, and I don't know if it's recorded, but, but it really began to grapple with this issue of what kind of an Israel can really live at peace with its own Palestinian citizens as well as its Palestinian neighbors in a hopeful future Palestinian state. It's not really America's job, but to the extent to which the conversation in America holds that back, stop holding it back. And I also feel like it's the right thing to say in this gathering. You cannot make a demographic argument for peace and really be getting to grips with what Israeli democracy means. What having a democracy that fully enfranchises all its citizens, including its Palestinian citizens, if two states ends up being about a more Jewish and less democratic Israel, well, sorry, I'm not there. That's not what I'm about when I talk about two states. The demographic argument should become pasul, muhsa. We should not use it. We might need a more challenging Palestinian leadership to get us there. I don't know. We don't have that today. We're not challenged enough by the other side. But I will close by saying this. An agreement based on injustice won't hold. And this is difficult for me to say. But injustice can be, and very often is, an episode, a moment in the history of a national movement, in the history of a state. There are many states, I can think of one or two while I'm standing here in Washington, D.C., that have passed through moments of injustice in building their state. <clears throat> I think this room will say, you know what? An original injustice in the circumstances of the 1940s is something that we can't expect the Palestinians to ever welcome but it's probably something that most of us can live with. But you have to bookend that injustice. You have to realize there's a moment where our national movement has to put injustice behind it and work towards a progressive vision, an inclusive vision, the kind of Israel that we can be proud of. Thank you very much. to follow from you, uh, Daniel, and uh, I'm equally delighted to be here with such a distinguished panel, and again, louder, can you hear me now? I have to adjust the microphone after Daniel. You know. <laughs> really, and you know, this particular panel is the reason why I'm here, because I have been traveling very extensively in the last few weeks, and my wife wouldn't even accept the idea of me traveling. So she asked me, where are you going? I said, to D.C. She said, why? I said, I'm going to go give advices to Mr. Kerry. She said, okay, okay, you go now. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, we in Palestine uh, don't go by addition. We go by multiplication. So I am afraid I don't have five. I have eight points to tell you. <laughs> Very quickly, I'll just pass uh, through these points to try my best really to see what we, from a Palestinian perspective, would want Mr. Kerry to do. And the first thing I think is that Mr. Kerry is ought to tell the Israeli government is that our money, our support, comes with our advice. That's the first advice. You take our support and you must take our advice. I think it has been for so long that these two things are so unrelated. They must be related. Because I think the advice of the U.S. successive administrations have been vivid and clear. Particularly in the arena of the settlement expansion. The second advice I have is that we should be very cautious about, instead of reaching a lasting peace process, to re go for a lasting process. And this has been really a life experience of Oslo. And you know, when you have such a long process, it becomes almost a process designed 
to prevent the outcome. And by, by the way, this is not a fantasy. This is exactly what happened for us and with us in the last 20 years. It was a process designed to block the outcome. With all that it creates in terms of the status quo, the beneficiaries, the army of experts and peace industry experts and what have you. Third, please, Mr. Kerry, don't start from point zero. We have a pile of negotiations, agreements, frameworks, several Israeli prime ministers who have signed agreements, including with Olmert. Start from there. We have no time to waste. Number four, best thing to do is to start by implementing the signed agreements. We have already a very considerable amount of agreements that have been signed between the PLO and the State of Israel. Let's implement them. Out of all the accords that were signed with Israel, Israel only respects, adheres to two provisions. Tax collection on behalf of the PA and security coordination. The rest doesn't exist. Why don't we start by just implementing those parts that Israel itself, including the Netanyahu government, have agreed upon and signed? For instance, in the Oslo agreements, interim agreements, we have a safe passage that connects Gaza to the West Bank. Those who want to see the Palestinian people really, really start the journey of reconciliation, the best thing is to allow people to mix, <coughs> to travel, to become one nation again. In the Oslo agreements, we have uh, a provision for an airport, a seaport, much more uh, uh, abilities of movement. <coughs> Number five, please, Mr. Kerry, don't engage in the interimness and the transitional agreements. We know it now by experience. It becomes permanent. All these ideas of provisional borders, of bridges so we build confidence have been tried. And in our situation, rather than they becoming confidence building, bridging periods, they become a race for land grab. You know the settlement size and the number of settlers doubled in the, in the first five years of Oslo, became a land grab. Don't engage in that. And I'm not sure we have even the time to engage in, in another yet interim agreement. Number six, one of the biggest issues here is that what da Daniel and Gadi mentioned is that of the asymmetry between the two parties. You cannot just assume that a bilateral process between us and the Israeli government is going to really, really, really be a meaningful, serious negotiations. It's almost more of a diktat. Some of you have heard the Israeli official line last night. I'm not going to mention by who. A diktat. Some of it denial, some of it saying what would be the finish line from now, what do we accept, what we don't accept. So, as Daniel said, there is always a need for a third party. Here, I'd like really the U.S. to consider seriously the role of other parties. Europe plays a very important role. And America must allow for a much more active European role. The EU guidelines was as important as the Kerry Initiative itself. The EU guidelines was a push factor for Mr. Netanyahu to come to the negotiation table and was a pull factor for us Palestinians to come to the negotiation table. The UN decision to admit Palestine as a non-member state this overwhelming majority of nations around the world to vote for us was also a push factor for Netanyahu and a pull factor for us. Mr. Kerry allow us to leverage our status in the international community. It's good for peace. It's good for Israel. It's good for the two-state solution. Our president stood in the UN General Assembly last year and said, I promise you that my quest for UN you, for you membership does not substitute negotiations. 
And to, last week he went back to the UN and he reminded his audience that he has respected his promise. In fact, it is not only not a substitute for bilateral negotiations, it's the best way for it. And I don't understand why so far Secretary Kerry has this idea that when we negotiate bilaterally with Israel, everything else has to stop. Freeze. We must freeze our UN movement. We must freeze our work with the EU to impose some sort of pressure on the status quo. That is not helpful if you really want the Israeli government to listen. Leave us to do some peaceful, non-violent, legal leverage of our status so the negotiating table becomes much more meaningful. <laughs> Number seven. Remember, I have eight. Please, Mr. Secretary, don't repeat the mistake of Camp David II. That was horrific. And in fact, horrific to an extent that it, was, it did not only lead to the Second Intifada, <coughs> but it led to the, the man who caused the whole mayhem, Ehud Barak, to losing his job and to the demise of the Israeli peace camp and to the current propagation that there is no Palestinian partner. If you want to, as Gadi said, present a plan, an initiative, invite us again, prepare, prepare very well. Make sure that the two parties understand exactly where you're going. <coughs> Make sure that you're not alone, you have the world with you. Make sure that if your attempt fails, you don't blame any party. Blame game was very destructive. It cost us a decade, 13 years, totally wasted. Because of that moment when Barack, Ehud Barak blamed the Palestinians following by Mr. Bill Clinton. And so far, or what we're following from the Netanyahu side of the story is the preparation for the blame game. The last point. Please, Mr. Kerry, understand that we in Palestine have, have politics too. We have this word called legitimacy, and we have some serious considerations for our political system. Please understand our red lines. There are red lines that we have. And if you don't understand our red lines, the Camp David II experience will be repeated. When we offer the two-state solution, and I am so proud to stand before you today, the people from all over the U.S. who are supporting the two-state solution, this was a Palestinian initiative in 1988. We initiated the two-state solution. We defend it. When we go to the U.N., we defend it. We deposit it in the United Nations. We want to ensure that it is implemented. But the two-state solution for us, the 1967 borders for us, is the absolute maximum we could offer and the absolute minimum we could accept. Live with it. This is the truth. There will be no Palestinian leader who is capable to sign less of an agreement than this. Now, like all states, like all international norms, there will always be minor border rectification happened between so many states. We are absolutely happy, as in two states, the state of Palestine and the state of Israel, sitting there and negotiating the mutual interest of this demarcation of borders. But this doesn't mean that ex ante you claim that you are building settlements in the areas that you intend to swap. You are legitimizing the building of your settlements because we accept the, this minor border. Don't misread us. Don't. Also, our offer in 1988 and our offer today does not mean in no way that building two states has to be built on the compromise of the rights of two-thirds of my nation, the refugees. What justice is that? 
And what solution is that? And what sustainability is that? Are we going to just tactically bluff our way? You're talking about two-thirds, including myself. <coughs> I think that refugees, some of them would want to stay where they are, but they want to be compensated. Some of them would want to come back to the Palestinian state, and they want to be compensated. Some of them want to resettle to a third state, Canada, the U.S., they're right. But they want to be compensated. Some of them want to go back to their original homes. But all of them want their right to be recognized. And I, for one, as a refugee, who was born in a tent in the Rafah refugee camp to the very south of Gaza, I tell you that if I am asked what is the easiest issue of the five main core issues, I would say refugees. It was made to be the mother of all issues and problems and evil. Wrong. Wrong. But portraying it as the threat Portraying it as it has to be the compromise for the two-state solution is not going to bring any Palestinian leadership capable to sign it. <laughs> with that, I end and I leave it with, uh, for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much to our three panelists. Um, I'm just going to take a few minutes before we open up to the audience. But, Hussam, we, have to, we can't just leave that like that. Right? I can't just leave. I can't go with my original questions I've been jotting down here. Let's talk about the Palestinian red lines. I think it's a very interesting, important topic, and everybody can weigh in here. But you, you mentioned Palestinian red lines on refugees, right, and on territory. And you talked about minor uh, border uh, rectification or modifications. Can you be more specific about that, what that looks like? And then on the, on the you know, sort of when you look at the settlements like Male Adumim and the big, the big blocks and things like that, what you mean. And on the question of refugees, as you were talking, I was saying, whoa, that's the hardest issue, <laughs> the way he's framing it. And then you said it was the easiest, which made me feel much better. <laughs> so what is the red line on refugees then? Let's really, because this whole debate, it keeps coming up about, you know, President Abbas saying, I know I'm from Tzfat and I'm not going back to Tzfat. And, 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 you know, what is the red line? And how many are going to, do you envision going back to the original homes? Turn the, turn the, turn that mic around. So you to start and then, you know, the other one. It's all yours. I think uh, half of the answer was already answered by Daniel. <clears throat> You know, I, I did study, by the way, I was a former Harvard uh, scholar, not okay. current. I returned to Ramallah. And um, in there, I was at the Kennedy School, and part of my fascination was this whole field of negotiations and the Harvard negotiation project. And <clears throat> Number one thing is that in, in there, they tell you that negotiation is not, and it should never be about the principles. You don't sit and negotiate the principles. If you don't agree in advance on the principles, then you have nothing to negotiate. You agree on the principles, and then you sit to negotiate the modalities of implementing the principles. And this was a major, major, major fault of the last 20 years. While we Palestinians, and this is not the blame game, this is the fact, have fully recognized Israel as a state on its 1967 borders. Israel has yet to recognize us as a state. Israel recognizes us only as an entity, PLO, representing the Palestinians. And as such, since we signed Oslo, our territory has not been occupied but disputed. What I am propagating is that we have to reverse this and start all over from the sense that Mr. Kerry should go to Mr. Netanyahu and tell him, do you recognize Palestine on the 1967 borders? And if you do, then you should sit and discuss issues of mutual concern, like border issues. 
I am not a, an expert in, uh, in, in the issues you ask me. But I would ex expect that we Palestinians would understand that we might need some certain areas that would make our state much more contiguous. And therefore, we will ask for it. But as a state, with our borders defined, how do you expect me to give something that I don't have? Like, how do you want me to uh, discuss security when I don't have my, know my jurisdiction? Where are the areas I'm responsible on? As for refugees, there are four options that need to be offered to the refugees. All of them, including myself. But before that, before these four options, you have to come to me and to my father, who was born in where Israel now, and lost his home, and my mother, and you tell them, Oops, first thing, we realize the grave injustice that happened to you. We acknowledge the Nakba. And we take full responsibility of our part. My God, 70% of their pain would be gone. 70 the denial is not the way forward in this. Israel has committed, Allah, all the documented Israeli scholarship, has committed massacres and has induced the transfer of my parents. Not me saying. Then, once you do that, you know, we Arabs, we are bubbly bubbly and we are sometimes too naive. You come to my father and you tell him, however, I'm sorry, your, your home has been occupied for the last 60 years. And my sons and my daughters ha were born here. They know nothing but this home. I think my father would have to think. Seriously. But you come to my father and you tell him, you have four options, sir. You can go back to the Palestinian state. You can settle where you are if you are in Jordan, in, uh, in Syria, in Lebanon, and we will ensure that you will be given full citizenship. You can be resettled in a third place, or you go back to your original home, or in Israel, somewhere close by. Well, my father has really resettled already by himself. He's in London, in Notting Hill, living a beautiful life. I'm not <coughs> sure if he would want to go and learn Hebrew again. I'm not sure. <laughs> or serve in the Israeli army at 70 years old. But my father, Janine, is after dignity and recognition and acknowledgement. The way you always need and we do, acknowledging the suffering that you have undergone as a nation. The Palestinians have gone through a Nakba, a catastrophe. They lost two-thirds of their nation in one week. That's the answer. Uh. Thank you for that, Sam. I want to invite Gadi and um, Daniel to, to comment on that and also to, to really flesh out this point on the, on the 67 border and getting a clear articulation from the Israeli Prime Minister. When President Obama not too long ago said the word 67 border, Netanyahu had a conniption. Does everybody remember? <laughs> he humiliated the U.S. President in front of the cameras at the White House, right, in response. So the question is, can you foresee any way of getting a, the kind of articulation that Hussam is talking about? I mean, certainly on Nakba, as anybody who was in the panel earlier, you know, reflecting on the, there's a law now that you're not allowed to mark El Nakba in Israel, you know, passed. It's exactly the opposite of what Hussam is saying, right? So how are we going to get Israeli leadership, the current Israeli leadership, to say some of these things? And do you agree that it is necessary? Gadi, you want to go first? So first of all, I uh, totally agree with Hossam that the blame game is not productive. So I will not uh, uh, go into it. Uh, I do think that the, the 67 um, lines or the, the borders issue, like the security issues, are theoretically easier to resolve than the uh, Jerusalem and refugees issues. Although practically, I agree that the practical solution for Jerusalem and for refugees is within reach. 
But since there are symbolic issues, and as Hussam said, there are issues that deal more with words and feelings than with practical arrangements on the ground, it's more complicated to, for leaders to take the, the necessary decisions on them. But you know, when you ask about uh, uh, borders, there is the Palestinian proposal map put on the, on, on the table, swap of 1.9% uh, based on the 67 line. There is a proposal put by Prime Minister Olmelt, around 6% swap. There is the Geneva Initiative model, 2.3% swap. This is the big deal, the difference between two and four and six, what are we talking about? The size of a few neighborhoods here? The, if you call it 67 or you don't call it 67, when Netanyahu himself is talking about settlement blocks, it means that he doesn't talk about all the rest. When he talks about security presence on the Jordan River, it means that he doesn't talk about Israeli sovereignty on the Jordan River. So for Netanyahu, I, I feel, since he is so much concerned, concerned with, the, with the threats, with the dangers, for him, Security is a real issue, but the size exactly of the land that will be annexed to Israel, if it will be 4.3% or 3.8% or 5.2%, is really not, is not an important issue. Most of the Israelis don't know where the 67 line is, don't know where the, the Palestinian neighborhoods of East, Jeru East Jerusalem are. They never visited them. They really don't care if Kfar Akeb will be part of the United Jerusalem uh, forever capital of the state of Israel, blah, blah, blah. And I think uh, both parties, again, with the help of a third uh, party, can relatively easy, in an easy way, reach an agreement on, on borders if they have the political will and the political courage to do it. This is the key question or the key obstacle on the road to peace, not the issue of territories or borders. Hussam has to go, so let's uh, give a round of applause for Hussam, please. <laughs> Thank you. Hussam, I have one important point of disagreement with you. I'm a proud North Londoner. Notting Hill really in West London isn't that great. I'm not sure your dad would be making the right decision. Um, Daniel, do you want to add on this question of the, how do we get someone to articulate on 67 borders? And if, you, if those of you who have questions want to line up at the mic, we're going to take a few after Daniel's done. So I'll be very quick. Um, on the refugees, I don't think you have an Israeli leadership anywhere near, and I'm talking quite broadly now, not just the current prime minister, anywhere near ready to articulate what I think needs to be articulated on that issue, which is why I tend to think that we may have to do this as a border first, which for me includes Jerusalem, and as a truth and reconciliation process later between two states. But let me just park that thought. On, on 67, I personally don't see uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu as having walked towards a realistic two-state dispensation. From what I understand of what's going on in the negotiations, there is an absolute refusal to present anything approaching a map, principles for a map, even what constitutes settlement blocks. And I think it's an obfuscation because Prime Minister Netanyahu's position has been settlement blocks, but I'm not going to tell you what, what they are, where they end. Not removing any settlements and this ongoing security presence. I don't know of a, of a, of a state off the back of this kind of conflict which is sovereign and it still has the former occupying army resident in it and that that somehow constitutes sovereignty. So... I would love to be wrong on Bibi, but my point would be, whether I'm right or wrong, 
the aim of this process should be to test that by adhering rigidly to an effort to get an engagement on territory. And this is where I think Gadi and myself would agree, is that that's, you know, don't let this go in other directions. We have to address the territory because that's where we'll find out. And by the way, I think it, if it emerges that Netanyahu was not willing to make what in the eyes of, of, I think, most Israelis would constitute a reasonable territorial dispensation, I'm not sure that that, that doesn't set off a positive dynamic in Israeli politics. I think it might well do. All right, first question. Please, please introduce yourself. Emily Polinchek from Portland, Oregon. I'm interested in any comments from either of the other two can panelists about Hussam's suggestion that previously signed uh, parts of previous agreements be implemented immediately. Ready? We'll, we'll, we'll take a couple questions. Okay, previously signed. Go ahead, sir. I am Ashraf Ansara from Orlando, Egyptian heritage. Uh, the question is uh, based on what I have been hearing. Uh, Iran nuclear program is a distraction. I believe the Arab world and the Sunni are uh, more threatened by Iran than Israel. What do you think of that? Okay. Take one more and then we'll answer. Hello, my name is Renee. I am a freshman at Princeton University. Um, I want to know what is the definition of a Palestinian refugee and what should be the definition of a Palestinian refugee? Okay. All right, let's take the first one. Previously signed agreements in a nutshell. What does that mean? Do you agree with Hussam? Danley, you want to take that? or? I, I, I don't attribute much importance to it myself. I, I mean... The, the more important previously signed agreements, without boring people, like what constitutes a third further redeployment, uh, are not agreed, actually, as to what the dimensions of that are. So I, I, don't, I actually do not want these negotiations to spend their time focusing on those issues and to let Netanyahu play around with uh, some of the issues that were raised. Do you, do you want us to go on? and? Or, Johnny, I mean, do you, what, I mean, do you agree or...? Just briefly, uh, when I spoke about old language, uh, one of the slogans um, was always there is nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. I think we should also think about if something is agreed, it can be implemented. I mean, just quickly on this question of safe passage, I mean, it seems like a, I mean, if, the, if the Israelis could just do that, it would be an enormous gesture to the Palestinians. It's something that Condi Rice tried for years to get done and just do it, no? Palestinians don't want it now. With all due respect, you've got Palestinian division. There's not, there, 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 you have two competing regimes. I mean, I, I think Palestinian division is debilitating, but we're more entrenched in Palestinian division today than we were a few months ago and a few years ago. It will be a passage, but I'm not sure it will be a safe passage, safe for the Palestinians, I'm yeah. to speak. We do need to get to this question of do you do the deal with just Abbas right now and forget Gaza and Hamas? Just, it was your yes, no answer on that? If you've got an Israeli government willing to withdraw from the West Bank and East Jerusalem to an agreed border based on 67, and it wants to treat Gaza as a renegade Palestinian province un unless and until you have Palestinian unity on reasonable terms and then there can be a safe passage as well, I'm not going to be against that. I just kind of think we're putting the cart before the horse here because you haven't got an Israeli side that's willing to have that conversation in the first place. All right. Moving on. Arab states more threatened than Israel, yes or no? By Iran? I, I don't know who is threatened more, but I'm sure that there, there is a mutual interest right now between Israel and some Arab states. But the thing is that if, if I, as an Israeli, if I want kind of stability in the region, in the Middle East, between the east of the Middle East, okay, the Gulf states, uh, the, between the east till Istanbul, okay, between the east and Istanbul, you have to go through East Jerusalem. You have to solve the problem with the Palestinians if you really want to coordinate and, and to serve the, the common interests that you have with other countries. Otherwise, they will not be open about it, and they will be very cautious before there's any agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. And just a quick definition on Palestinian refugees, 4867. Anybody want to? I'm comfortable with the UNRWA definition of who, is a, who, of who a refugee is. I wouldn't like someone to define for me uh, who I am. I don't think it would be reasonable to define for someone else who they are. You have an international. All right, we'll take three more. 
Hi, Mark Hendel, Washington University and St. Louis School of Law. I have a question about red lines. We heard Hussam talk a little bit about red lines on the Palestinian side. I've heard lots of talk about Jerusalem being the eternal and undivided capital of the Jewish people in Israel. I've heard about the right of return for Palestinians and how that would completely de destroy the, the Jewish state. Which red lines are the true red lines and which can be negotiated? Okay. Uh, David Abraham, Miami, Florida. Uh, at least since 1990, American efforts to uh, uh, elicit Israeli uh, movement have consisted entirely of inducements of carrots. There was some indication in what Daniel said that uh, things commonly considered sticks ought to be conceived of as well. I'm wondering uh, what sorts of things would be available and more importantly, perhaps in this group, conceivable given the commitments of J Street. Hi, my name is Casey from the University of Puget Sound. Everybody has questions about Hussam, but I have one more. Uh, he recommended tying US aid, to, uh, US aid to Israel to advice that the United States gives them. Uh, any thoughts on that? What, like, what would the impact be on the Knesset and, uh, and on Israeli society as a whole? All right, let's look at the red lines. But I think it's, it's a very broad, good question, but I don't think we can do a whole, we can't do it in 30 seconds. So, like, we want to pick one red line? Like, it, you want to pick one, Gotti? Okay. Let me try to do it in 30 seconds. After so many years of fake red lines, I think we, we already know the real red lines. For the Palestinians, is a, a Palestinian state based on the 67 border with East Jerusalem as their capital. For Israel, is security arrangements and no right of return of refugees to Israel in the massive meaning of the word. That's it. And since they are different, they can live together. All right. Stand corrected. This question of sticks, um, and we want to take that up. What are the sticks that can be used effectively? Now, Daniel, you mentioned about the European boycott of settlements. Is there something beyond that? I mean, the, th the third question actually fits into this, this question of U.S. aid being a, p a possible stick as well. First of all, Europe's not boycotting settlements. What is under consideration is to clearly demark what are settlement products and what are not settlement products, and that European taxpayers' money, European government projects do not get spent in settlements, which I think is an eminently reasonable thing. Um, first of all, on the U.S. side, I started one of my comments by saying I'm just going to stick within the realm of what's realistic. So I will continue to stick within the realm of what's realistic, um, including the positions that J Street takes on this. Uh, hence what I said about how America can influence the conversation in Israel. It can't influence it um, by using the leverage that it may have, because that's not in play. And we just have to acknowledge that that's not in play. What I... What I would say is this, is that given that we've tried, so, we've tried for so long, I don't know how many people remember the meaning of life, the Monty Python film. Just one wafer thin mint, monsieur. Uh, Israel is bloated, is bloated on the carrots that it has been given. So I don't think we should be trying to dream up new inducements. It's one thing to say we're not going to remove all of those carrots or any of those carrots and start using sticks. But I, I, you know, Israel has gotten what it wants, essentially. There may be things you could add on. I think they're relatively dismissed. There may be things that are an exception um, to that. But I, I, I mean, let me put it like this. Most Israeli politicians of a senior level who represent what would be considered the more moderate, pragmatic camp including the minister who addressed this forum last night, constantly make the following case to the Israeli public. They say to the Israeli public, we cannot continue being in the territories, not having a two-state deal, not having a border with the Palestinians, because, and then normally the because consists of two components. Sadly for me, it doesn't have a moral leg to it for most of them, not for everyone. It normally consists of two components. Number one, because demographically, etc., you know that one. Number two, the world will not accept it. Israel will ultimately face international isolation, prior status. It will impact us badly. The experienced reality day-to-day -day for Israelis is, what are you talking about? 
everything's fine, there is no cost and consequence for occupation. As good patriots, the politicians who make that argument are also the first to say, Europeans, you're threatening this, you have to stop it. I'm a good Israeli patriot, how dare you do that? But actually, if one doesn't create costs and consequences for the occupation, one is making those more pragmatic leaders out to be liars in front of their own public, and one is suffocating the potential debate in Israel for, oh really, they were right, this does have costs and consequences. Before we take the last question, I'm being handed a clarification from someone here. There's no, Ms. Zakaria, there's no law forbidding the mentioning of the Nakba. The legislation you're referring to can potentially, but not automatically, deny state funding for organizations commemorating the establishment of Israel as a tragedy. Important distinction. Okay. We have time maybe for one more question because we have about 90 seconds, and I apologize to the other people who are lined up, and I'm sure our panelists will stick around for more questions after. I'm Jerome Siegel, president of the Jewish Peace Lobby. Um, it's, it's been argued that the, a major determinant of Netanyahu's willingness to be forthcoming in the current negotiations is his expectation as to what would follow by way of a peace process if and when the search for comprehensive solution fails. And in that context, my question is, there's a proposal that former Israeli Foreign Minister Shlomo Ben-Ami and top uh, European diplomat, Javier Salana, put forward uh, for those circumstances, which would call for the United Nations to establish an international commission that would seek to develop a totally detailed peace treaty between the two peoples that would prove to be acceptable by a majority of both peoples, to then go to the governments, call on them to use that as a jumping off point for negotiations to see if they can agree on any mutually acceptable improvements, and if they can or if they cannot improve it one way or the other, then to put it to a referendum of their people. And my question is, how would Netanyahu react during the current period of the search for comprehensive negotiations if that proposal gained traction as what the fallback would be rather than a fallback to a partial solution? God, do you want to take it? That's the last thing. And last question, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, Jerome, my, my quick answer to you is I think that uh, Bibi's reaction will be negative. He is against everything that sounds international, UN, uh, uh, kind of with a UN flavor, and he believes in only bilateral, if he believes, he believes in bilateral uh, uh, negotiations. So I think basically w what we're heading is to try and reach the traditional deal. I know that we are obliged to think outside the box, but sometimes... I, I say something now outside the box. Sometimes the answers are in the box. And, and for this conflict, the solution is in the box that we all know. Now, uh, let me just conclude by maybe two sentences as an Israeli and, if I may, as a Jew as well. I, I share completely Daniel's desire to see a better Israel a more democratic Israel. By the way, I hope that also my Palestinian neighbors, partners, and friends will live in a better, more democratic society and state of their own. But I think we should not put it as a condition to, to, to an agreement, since if we have to be realistic, we should understand that this will be the outcome of an agreement, not a precondition to it. And I, I really think, since, since I believe as a, as a Zionist, and I, I'm sure I can say it in this room, as a Zionist, I believe that the essence of the state of Israel is that the Jewish people will have the key to this one place on earth that is ours, of course with equal rights for all its citizens. But in order to preserve this key, we have to preserve and, and establish in Israel, in Israel, which is Jewish and democratic, and the only way to reach it is through a two-state solution. So I think peace in the two-state solution is not only an Israeli interest. It's a Jewish interest. And that's why I'm thankful to you for being here, for what you have been doing for this cause, 
and with the typical Israeli chutzpah, I'm thankful uh, in advance for all what you will be doing to serve our common goal. Thank you. We're out of time. We're just going to have 30 more seconds from Daniel for a final rejoinder before we invite Stanley up to close the session. Just on that idea, I like the idea, Jerome, because we need to cre keep thinking creatively. My problem with the idea is it falls in the realm of ain't going to happen because what Netanyahu would do would be to call the Americans and say, what's this nonsense I hear about you being willing to go to the United Nations? And they'd say, don't worry, it's nonsense. Um, I, I do want to respond to, to Gadi and, and, and make the following comment. I, I, I agree with you, and I'm not suggesting that sequentially we have to win the fight for a progressive Israel before we can end the occupation and have two states, but we mustn't lose sight of that either. And we have to at least bear in mind that there are certain shortcuts we might be willing to take, including rhetorically, that may be damaging to that ability to build a progressive Israel. I thoroughly believe that the chances of Israel getting to a place that I think all of us would want it to get to are so undermined the longer we live as an occupying power. It's so obvious. It was said since 67 and it is coming home to roost today. Increasingly in damaging ways for Israel. Well, uh... Um, I, while, while we all believe that uh, John Kerry will not listen to these individual suggestions from us, I believe we do have a dialogue with him. He has asked us, as American Jews, to make our voices heard and stand behind his initiative. And we, by being here, 2,800 of us, the J Street organization, you in this room, and these specific panelists, have shown that we are answering and we have answered his call. We do have the dialogue, we are behind him and I want to thank the input that we've received here this afternoon. Superb and thank you so much.